Hello, sisters. Welcome to the Sacred Medicine Podcast, weaving powerful, soulful practices into functional medicine. Step into this beautiful space of devotion and explore everything from nurturing foods, rituals, sexuality, and awakening your innate sensuality. It is time to own your radiance. This is the Sacred Medicine Podcast. Sacred Medicine Podcast. And this week we have a new guest, Stephanos Safandos. He has been immersed in deep men's empowerment work and the exploration of intimate relationships, merging the best of Eastern and Western methodologies and philosophies to promote balance, sacredness, and power in love and life. Using integrative techniques and methods, he has created programs, models, and systems to enhance the quality of your life, your intimate relationships, and in essence, bringing you closer to your potential. So today's conversation was all about sacred partnership. And this is something as if you've been listening to the podcast for a while, it's something that I just absolutely love talking about. So today we talked all about what is sacred partnership And if you, you know, if you're curious about it, I would definitely take a listen to today's episode. I think it helps to create a beautiful depth and connection with the person that you're in a relationship with. And I think it's so beautiful and just so important to, to, to learn some of these techniques. And actually he does talk a lot about what is it and what makes it different from just a regular partnership. So I, loved hearing all of the ways that him and Christine, his current fiance is how they explore their sacred partnership and some of the things that they do on a somewhat very regular basis. So listen in and on to the show. This week's guest is Stephanos Sifandos. And I have been waiting for this interview for a while now. So Stephanos, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. Pleasure to be here. So I I follow you on Instagram. And so I, I love what I really want to talk about today is sacred partnership. And mm. But I kind of want to start a little bit. I want to go back and I just want to find out a little bit about how you sort of came to really diving into this topic and really sort of living it, what sort of prompted it for you? For me, it came from not being in what I, I mean, I didn't even know what a sacred union really was. I thought I knew, I th- you know, I'd heard that term before I was somewhat familiar with it, but very much it was on my periphery. I was, years ago, I was more in my in my ego than, than anything else. So what I mean by that is that I was very stubborn in the way that I saw the world. I was very um, one-sided and and simply structured. And what I mean by that is that I wasn't really open to new ideas of being in the world. And I was more concerned, or rather, my 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 nervous system, my my unconscious self, was just more concerned with familiar patterns of behaviour based on what I learned growing up during my developmental years, which of course I didn't I didn't really put all that together until I really started diving into it. Um, but essentially I was really coming from a place of of deficit and pain and 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 suffering. I was choosing to suffer and not look at my stuff and not look at what changes I could make in my life. And I was there were parts of me that were so entrenched in the greater parts of it was so entrenched in choosing to be in ignorance and choosing to to suffer in relationship and behave in a way that was not conducive to a healthy relationship in any capacity. And, and part of that was being frustrated, not really listening to others, not seeing clearly and deeply the, the vantage point, perspective and needs of others, not honouring others, being dishonest in relationship, lying in relationship, being unfaithful in relationships. And that that I, I thought at some 
very twisted level, at some distorted level, that that was the norm. That was that was okay to be that person in relationship, and I left that unchecked. And, and the guilt and the shame and the, and the compounding of that, that that led to deeper frustration with myself and with the relationship and externalized projection and blaming and shaming outside of myself instead of taking responsibility for my own behaviors and actions and not really seeing the nuances and the subtleties in how we were both behaving and that we were, whenever I was in in, in intimate romantic relationship, that I wasn't able to really see the nuances and the minutia in the in the detail, mm. in the in the subtlety of action. Okay, why is this person behaving this way? Why are they being this way? Why do they believe this? And and likewise for myself, I would never break that down and go into the details because I didn't have capacity. I didn't really want to. I wasn't prepared to to do the work because that requires a great deal of effort and attention and energy. And I just wasn't prepared to go there and do that. And so I came from a very broken family. And when I mean broken, I mean that my family remained together, but internally they were broken. There was violence and aberrance with my parents against us, myself and my brother. There was great volatility and emotional abuse in our relationships. And so I grew up with that, thinking that's the norm. And so at some level, I replicated a lot of that. Whilst I wasn't physically violent in my relationships, I was emotionally abusive. And, and I was attracting that as well. At some level, my partners were that as well with me. They were very volatile with me as well. Not always, um, but often. And so I wasn't making those connections. I wasn't seeing that. And, and really all of that, I'm giving you a very short, shorter version, but all of that became unraveled when um, in, a, in a relationship uh, about six years ago, I was with a woman and she discovered that I was being unfaithful. And for me, that's when the tides really started to turn when I witnessed such deep pain in her, mm. in her face, in her being, in her body. Yeah. I just, I, 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 something really shifted deeply within me that, and, and, and all of the repressed shame and guilt and pain that I had been not only repressing in that relationship from my actions, but since my childhood, it just, it just flooded to the surface. And I was just, I was fucking overwhelmed massively. And I, I knew I had, I had two choices. I had either continue in absolute ignorance, uh, continue my life ignoring all of this that had really risen to my attention at a very visceral level, or make some deep changes and go down the rabbit hole or the rabbit holes and 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 submerge and not immerse into a new version of me until I had um I had done deeper work and I chose the latter and it was it was and it it is always I mean that that unraveling is still a journey for me that's a life journey now in terms of the principle I'm always going to and I'm careful when I use this you know the word absolute you know the word the word always is an absolute i will always be attentive to who i am being in the world for myself and for others and mm -hmm. and simply the earth it's just that the, the, that consciousness that i'm bringing into the world as, a, as an individuated spark and th that work that i chose to do was very deep and very confronting and very and, and and I mean I you know I can put words and adjectives to it. It was immensely painful and beyond. You know I mean, and we can go into that if you like. I have no problem with that. Um, but I'll, I'll stop there. Of course, I'm, I feel I've been talking for a few minutes. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. So you had this breakthrough when this happened, and this was six years ago. And since then, did you have um, men? You obviously. You must have had some mentors. Like, who did you turn to to start sort of becoming the person you are today? Yeah, I, 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 I sought. Um, I went very deep down the rabbit hole very quickly. So, spiritual counselors, um, spiritual healers, energy workers, shamans, psychologists, counselors. I spent. Uh, yeah, a great deal of time on my own in solitude as well. I, I felt that was a big part of my journey. I had to acquaint myself with all the darkest, all the quote unquote ugliest, yuckiest, darkest parts of myself. And I realized that that required, uh, you know, a solo journey as well. And so I did a lot of that. 
and, 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 and I would lean on and leverage uh, guidance and support when, when, I, when I really needed to. And there were times when I was stubborn and, and you know, because that, 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 that tenaciousness and can also be stubbornness when I wouldn't do that because because I was going through redefining myself as a man, so my own masculinity and my own sense of sovereignty itself and being in the layers of, of identity that I was shedding in the world. And so <clears throat> parts of me felt I needed to do that alone. And, and I don't regret any of that. And, uh, you know, in, in hindsight, um, would I change anything? No, not necessarily, but I maybe would have reached out a little bit more. Um, but in saying that, I did, I did really have support, and I, I felt very blessed. And and honestly, and there were some really close friends as well, um, and, and my brother. And, and if I didn't have that support, I don't know if I'd be here today, because I was go- I was going really, I was really losing myself down that rabbit hole. Uh, and it's, it's, I, I say often, it's, it's if you can go to those depths and come back from that but with a enlightened understanding of self and, and, and a deeper connection and gnosis and wisdom around who you are in the world, then it's worth the journey. It's, but it, you know, it's, 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 walking, it's walking a very thin line and a tightrope from, from a very high place with no, no parachute, you know, no, no harness because going, at that, going to those depths, it, you can lose your mind. Like I, I, I literally felt like I was losing my mind. Um, and I did. I was. I was losing layers of myself, and so it's it's a it's it's a it's a tight rope to walk, but worth it if if we can get through it. I feel very blessed that I had amazing people in my life um, to really pull me out when I was too deep. Yeah, I mean, I would say that. Do you do you believe that the majority of men out there who are struggling and suffering as well. I don't know if they would necessarily go out and and seek spiritual healers and therapists. Like I I like I know several men now who I have spoken to and I have tried to talk to them about seeking help of some kind and and it's like they just don't want to admit that they need help they think that they'll be fine Mm. and i think that's like the toughest thing so i applaud you for knowing that you needed the help and you went to find you know not just one person but many people that led you to where you are today yeah, the pain. I appreciate that. The pain, it, really, what it was was the pain was so overwhelming, and and I, I contemplated suicide, and I have multi, at multiple stages of my life when I've been in really dark times, and so I contemplated suicide, but I also knew that suicide wasn't something I wanted to do. I knew I was destined for something more than just that, and so I I, I spent as much time on my own being with that, acquainting myself with that. And and not and and maybe at the time, on, if I have to be really honest, maybe at the time, part of that was a, a form of self punishment, um, and, and that was part of my pattern that I broke around that, around guilting myself and punishing myself, and that was a developmental pattern, a compensatory strategy I developed as a child, um, and, and part of that maybe came from there, and, and part of it also came from. I need to I need to be on my own and actually understand what's going on within me, and that was that that very strong masculine part in me. So I would spend time on my own with these very deep, dark, new feelings, um, and I also knew that I can't do this alone. And I've been very blessed that, as a byproduct of my volatile family life, I would really moved out. Not, I never moved. Not that I moved out. Of course, I moved out of home. But not that I moved out of home when I was a kid or homeless or anything like that. But I, I really did grow up on the street in terms of I spent as little time at home as possible, and so I I became acquainted with myself in a different way there and had to develop a a toughness around that as well. And as a byproduct of that, I did actually make really good friendship, create really good friendships in my life, friendships that I still have today. That we've we've grown and evolved together during the years, um, and, and and really healthy relationships there that I've had for twenty plus years, and so that's an anomaly in 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 men to, in in contemporary times. I'll tell you that now. Right. That's not that's not a common thing. I feel very blessed that I have that because the majority of men are very isolated. 
feel very lonely, have shallow relationships, um, and what, what relationships they do have, they meet on un- very unhealthy terms and conditions and, and, you know, habits and hobbies that are not healthy or conducive to them and to the longevity of that relationship or the longevity of their personalities. And so, and I had some of those friendships too, don't get me wrong, but the vast majority, I was very blessed to have very supportive, loving, um, loyal, uh, connected friendships, intimate, emotional, emotionally connected friendships. Yeah. Uh, and we had a, a variety of experiences together that forged that the strength of that. And so I was able to then leverage that, and that was very beneficial. Amazing, amazing. So let's fast forward to today and – you are in a currently in a really beautiful partnership with your girlfriend's name is well fiance right fiance christine yes fiance yes yes Yes. and uh, i follow her as well she's great and i listen to her podcast um Mm. so tell me i just i would love to know some of the like some of the things you now sort of practice in your relationship that you would say um is part of being in a sacred partnership like what are some of the things that i mean not intimate things obviously but some of the things that um you would mind sharing about some of the things that maybe you do or some of the practices you you do together yeah sure uh there are so many um (laughs) the first is I think, yeah, the first before any practices come into play is getting really clear on each other's values and our own values, what's really important to us in in relationship and out of relationship. So getting to know ourselves and each other at that deep, deeper level, I think is really, really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sets a foundation of of who we are and who we want to be in the relationship and where we want to take it. And and the, the willingness part to this is really important. And so... For both of us, one of our, our strong our strongest values within that dynamic is to really be clear that we're both willing to journey with each other and and to do that with as very little judgment as possible. And, you know, to say no judgment is almost an impossibility. I mean, to bypass the brain's primal function in that way is, is quite challenging, but to continue to come back to can I meet this with compassion and non-judgment? And am I willing to go down to the depths of this this difficulty and challenge with my partner, with 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 this this person that I'm in sacred union with? And am I willing just to do the work? Am I willing to look at myself? Am I willing to question who I'm being? Not in a sense that I'm not assertive or that I doubt myself, but if I'm behaving in a way that consistently is showing up in negative manner, then what is that about? And can I look at that? Can I look at that that within myself? Because that's tough to do. The ego doesn't want to do that. The ego doesn't want to know about how you're behaving in a in a in a in a difficult way. I mean, that's it doesn't want to take ownership of that. That's hard, right? And so, do we have a willingness to really look at our stuff and and also connect and communicate in a very compassionate and and again as little as possible judgmental way to each other? And and not and not come from our wounding and come from our own triggering and our own edges, and to be able to really communicate that. So having those those principles in place, I think, are really really important as a starting point. And then the practices can unfold. And so we hear communication being a big thing in relationship, and and it is absolutely communication is imperative and, and integral and important. And it's not so much communicating; it's how we communicate. And so again. Uh, one of our practices is communicating with uh, simultaneously with the other in mind whilst honoring our needs. And so I call that selfish selflessness. And so when we come from a place of what do we what do we need and then how can we express that in a way that's not going to be uh, like projectile vomit on the other person or, or blame and shame on the other person, making it 
making them wrong and communicating that to them in a way and in a timely manner, not when they're maybe in a, in a flurry and they're in between meetings and, and appointments and they're overwhelmed with a work schedule or uh, you know, a family member has just passed on and then passed away and you start speaking about you know, your, your, your issues that you're having at the moment with them or within the relationship. So be, being timely and then how that's communicated and basically communicating it in their language that they can be receptive to that. And part of that is not attacking. So we're both very, very mindful of whenever we're communicating a pain point or a difficulty or a challenge to not attack the other person, right. to really, really not attack the other person. And that can be a, that can be a hard thing to do because there's subtleties, especially when when you, you know, carry some level of intelligence, it can be, you be very, and, and if you've had to survive, I've, I've been a survivor so much, I've, I've identified as a survivor so much of my life, you, I, I've, be, I've learned to become very uh, savvy and manipulative, essentially, and I, I survived, I became very tact, uh, tactful in how I would uh, move through the world, and so it's, it's careful not bringing that into the relation and just coming from deeper transparency and honesty. Another simple practice that we have is that we, we really allocate morning time and evening time to each other. And so as we, as we awake, and there's, there's a combination of things. It could be having a, having a conversation around you know, how we slept or um, having a conversation about our day today. And maybe it's no conversation or maybe it's some eye gazing, maybe it's some holding each other, uh, maybe it's just some breath work that we do together. We, we often do breath work and meditate together and then I'll, I'll go and, and do additional either breath work and meditation on my own or stillness and silence practice. But we have that in the morning as well. Where there's, where there's, a, there's a more intimate connected practice that takes place. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's, it's having sex, sometimes it's lovemaking. It depends, right? right. Um, and then in the evening as well, it, it's quieting down, but just spending time with each other, not with the outside world. So we try and um, you know, we do our really do our best unless we have something like a project or a launch or a program that's happening and that, that requires some level of urgency. You know, we sh we shut down our our communication with the outside world and just go within and we go with ourselves. You know, mm -hmm. um, and so that's a that's a regular practice that we have. I think that the daily connection is really important. We're also very blessed that we. We work together, we serve together, we, we, we work from home a great deal as well, unless we're obviously traveling and, and teaching in that way. Um, and so we have multiple touch points during the day where we can have physical connection, where we can you know, stop for a hug and a kiss, where we can communicate with each other in, in whatever way, even if we've got back-to-back, -back, and we often do, back-to-back -back appointments. But that, that's, that's something that we're very mindful of, deliberate with. We're deliberate with having multiple touch points during the day particularly in the evening and the morning. Um, that, that's, that's, a, that's a real given for us. And that, that's been very powerful for us in terms of how we communicate and relate to each other. Mm, I love that. That's so beautiful. And so how is, how is this different than, you know, when, when you use the word sacred partnership versus mm. without the sacredness in it? What, what is the key differences there? The key difference in, in – it's, it's understanding the, the reason why you're in relationship and really it's how you define sacredness in, in partnership. And so what that really looks like is this. And I'll, so I'll go ahead and define sacred union by my terms and sacred partnership. And it's also understanding the levels of relationship. So the first thing that – and I'll, I'll define by what it's not. So I'll define it apathetically and I'll define by what it is as well. And so – for me, sacred union is not a selfish endeavor. The, the, primary, the primary objective of, of sacred, mostly the primary, the equal primary objective of sacred union is to ask, how is this relationship benefiting and serving the world? How is it of service to those that we come into contact with? So our union together, it's literally asking that question on a regular basis. And, and so the, 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 the catch here is that the only way that can actually really be asked authentically and the only way that that can um, really be of service to humanity and to earth is when we're honoring each other 
and honoring ourselves in the relationship. And so that's where the, you know, back to selfish selflessness, that's where the selfish part comes in, but in a healthy way and the selflessness as well. And so sacred union really is asking, it's not a low level or a, a, um, a level one relationship where we're coming in and saying, what can I get from this? Give me, give me, give me. What can I take from this relationship? How can I, uh, how can I experience what I need in this relationship at any cost? It's not that type of relationship. That's a, that many relationships fall into that category because many relationships come from a place of wounding and, and pain and fear. The individuals in that relationship come from fear. And so moving beyond that, and so and I spent a lot of time in those types of relationships where it was just about me. What can I get from this relationship? How can I feel good in this relationship? How can I experience hedonism at its peak in this relationship right. um, for me? That and so sacred union moves well beyond that, and it's it's about the the quality of the relationship is based on how the individuals show up to themselves and to each other, and how is the relationship really serving humanity? That's important, and so I look at sacred union as well as 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 there's a, as a, a one of the principles is <clears throat> the principle of of consistent knowing, and so what that looks like is. I'll give you an analogy. You know, we look up to, and where I am right now is really grey clouds, and it's been raining this morning. And I look at those grey clouds, and I know that those grey clouds aren't going to be here forever. Behind those grey clouds is a blue sky, and Sacred Union knows that there's, there's blue sky is always there. And I don't want to get into the science of it. This is you, you, as an analogy, right? It's like as a as a as a metaphor and, and use it as a um, uh, like a, a mythic story, so to speak. Um, but the blue sky is always there. Now those grey clouds are going to come. Sometimes when those grey clouds come, most people prefer blue skies and sunshine, so to speak. I'd say the vast vast majority of people would prefer that type of uh, environment. But when those grey clouds come, sometimes we get worried. Are those grey clouds going to be here forever? How long is it going to rain for? It's going to be stormy and windy and, and yucky. We're not going to be able to really go outside and be comfortable and we're not going to be in home, what, what appears to be homeostasis. And People start to panic. It's going to be like this forever. And those in sacred union can just drop back into the core of who they are and know that that grey cloud, those grey clouds, the rain, the thunder, the lightning storms, which could represent an argument or a difficulty or a challenge, they know it's right. temporal. They know it's not forever. <clears throat> Whereas many people, and I was very, I was very much like this. When I would be in an argument or a difficulty or a challenge, I wouldn't be able to see beyond the surface or the layers of that challenge. And I would start to think that this is the beginning of the end, this is the end of the relationship, why are we arguing so much? And I wouldn't even look at the cause. I'd just be so angry and frustrated in trying to defend my position. I would be in ego so much. With sacred union very quickly shifts out of that. By no means do we not go into our ego. Of course we do. But we quicker shift out of that and know that, okay, there's something else here. It's to teach us. Sacred union is for us. Challenge is for us. It's not happening to us. We're not victimized. Whereas a level one, level two relationship even goes very quickly and remains more in that victimization, into that ego, into that I'm being attacked. How can I defend myself? And so Christine and I have had to learn to really get out of that and shift out of that. And don't get me wrong, like we get into that uh, still, that absolutely, um, but we shift out of it quicker than we have before. And we realize that this is happening for us. How can we grow together? How can we go deeper into our intimacy, into our love and our care for each other? And I never, ever had that approach in, okay. in, in, in relationship. And right. so I'm giving you some examples of what, sacred union looks like and feels like. I hope that's substantial enough. Yes. No, that's great. And I just wanted to go back. So you had said, um, you had just said something like when two people come together and they sort of work together to make the world a better place, like you and Christine sort of do similar things and you are now like having retreats together. But what if there's mm -hmm. a couple and they do completely <laughs> separate things? They don't like someone's completely not doing like <laughs> Well, they're not doing similar work. Um, they do two different things for for a living. So mm -hmm. are, are you saying that solely people who are in sacred partnerships are also working together to change the world together? Because sometimes that's not necessarily possible, or is it? 
Uh, yes and no. So no, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is um, their relationship. So forget about what their vocation or their expression in the world is. It's the dynamic of their relationship, their emotional, spiritual, psychological intimacy that they share mm -hmm. and how they show up in the world. For example, they're out at a dinner party. How are they interacting with each other? What's the level of connection, the level of honoring that they have for each other? Are people picking up on that? Are people inspired by their union? He could be an architect. Oh, or, I see. Uh, okay. Yeah, he could, be a, he could be a nurse or a firefighter and she could be an accountant or a lawyer, completely irrelevant. How are they showing up with each other and how is their relationship, how is their relationship serving others and inspiring not only themselves and their own growth but maybe their children if they have children maybe their family members their friends the community maybe and maybe they are actually serving together maybe they're um, part of a non-for-profit that contributes to the to the world but their their connection and the quality of the way they are seen together and felt together in the world is adding value to the world oh, because they're, okay. Yeah, they're in a constant state of growth with each other. That's very important. They prioritize growth and expansion and therefore are not stuck in old stuff and stagnancy. Okay. Okay. I love that. Okay. Thanks for clarifying that. <laughs> um, yeah. Now I, I get what you're saying. Okay. I just didn't want, because it was a little confusing for me and I just wanted to clarify that if anyone else was a little confused about that. Um Okay, so how about what my other question was there's from from my circle of friends, um girlfriends and in the community communities that I'm in, uh there just seems to be more of a trend of women sort of on the rise and sort of um becoming leaders and also really into uh wanting to find a partner that is open to having this type of sacred partnership. How would you propose a way that a woman can sort of gently invite a man or woman or whoever the partner into experiencing this into having a deeper connection in this way? Yes. Great question. So firstly, um, uh, definitely check out, it was a few episodes back now, but on Christine's podcast over and on with it, we actually did a whole, her and I did a whole um, episode on this. It would have been about an hour or so. Oh. On, you know, essentially, yeah, how to get your man into personal growth. Um, so if you wanted to share that link in the, I will, in the I will. show notes. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's really jam-packed with a lot of wisdom. Okay. Essentially, I mean, and, we, and obviously I could speak to this for uh, hours, um, but, but essentially – is that, is that what I'm um, just to clarify? Is that what you're asking? Are you asking, you know, how do how does a a woman get her partner into, um, you know, into the work or into personal growth and into that level of alignment and values? Is that what you're asking to some degree? Um, well, that, but also if they weren't necessarily um, going to fully dive into going on retreats and reading books mm. and and all of that, but wanted was open to sharing it with their partner in a way, how could a woman open open that up and sort of invite them in? And even if it was just between the two of them in, in a way yep. that we're not saying, okay, so these are this is a list of things that you need to do now. You need to go to these things. You need to listen to these lectures, listen to these podcasts. But I wouldn't let's just that. start with us <laughs> two first. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So the first thing I would say, and, and I would say two, two initial things to this. Um, the first thing is be that change. Just we, we learn but as human beings, especially men, we, we really do, it, it is sort of irrespective of what your learning style is. Initially, we learn best by observation. So, and when you're consistent in that, so if, we, if I'm consistently observing my partner, uh, immerse herself in a particular spiritual practice and I'm viewing and observing the benefits of that. I'm naturally going to be curious as to how that may affect me and what would happen if I jumped into that. Yeah. Just be you, be you for you because that serves you. That's, that's really what I'm going to say. Don't, you know, don't change yourself to mold to your environment per se. And, and obviously it take that for what it is contextually, right. but just be you really, if you're inspired by yoga, 
if you're inspired by a, a Buddhist meditation practice that you, you go to every Tuesday evening, keep doing that. You don't need to force that on anyone else. Just keep doing that. Keep being you. Keep doing you. And at some point, your partner will either be curious or they won't. And if they don't and that doesn't serve you, then that, that leads it, lends itself to a conversation that you may have to have. The second thing is what I would say is very important is just have those conversations with your partner. Let them know what you value and ask them what they value. That's something that we don't do enough in relationships. But we, we, with this, this individuated movement that we're currently in, we're very quick to say, well, I like this and I love that. This is what I need and I do this. But what about asking what our partners need? And maybe they don't know. Maybe they don't know what their values are. So why don't you help each other understand what each other's values are Right. and go through that process together? Like really, really, most people just do stuff because they've been told to do that by society or some externalized value system or because it's habit, or because it's the norm and they've never questioned it. And so have those conversations. Hey, what do you really enjoy doing? If you had $20 million right now, if you had 100, ask questions like if you had $100 million right now and it was given to you tax-free, what would you do with your life? Where would you spend your time, your energy, your attention? You'd be very interested to see and to hear what people actually say. You know, some you might think, oh, yeah, most people just say they quit their job and go travel. Right. Well, what does that tell you about where they're at, where they're at in their life, and what they think about traveling? Maybe traveling is a really is a big value. So, what does traveling give them? Because anything that we're pursuing in life, we're pursuing because it gives us a feeling, it provides us with this inner state of being. And so, we have to unpack those layers. And so, have those conversations with your partner. Get to know them at a deep level. What really inspires them? What do they really want to be as a child? That question is always asked the children. What do you want to be when you grow up? You know, what were they dreaming of? What were they? What would they do a lot as a child? Would, would they play? And what type of play would they play? And we really get to know your partner at different levels. I have. When Christine and I first got together. Um, we were physically apart. And so we would spend a lot of time on the phone getting to know each other. We were introduced by mutual friends and we just, we just really hit it off. But what we did was ask each other really deep questions about life and funny questions as well. Like there was a spectrum of, you know, like for example, if, um, you know, one of the questions could be if there were the next president of the United States would it be an animal who would be, you know, what, what animal would you, would you want to be president <laughs> and why, you know, like, silly right. questions, like that, but it tells you a little bit about, you know, who you are. <laughs> yeah. 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 And deeper questions as well. Like, you know, what's your relationship with your father? You know, what's your biggest fear and how have you overcome that? What are your greatest challenges right now? You know, what really inspires you? What's your relationship to money? How much money would you like? Like, you know, because they're direct questions, but they also say a lot about where that person's at. So have those conversations and all of that, that is all spiritual growth. That is all personal development. That is all value aligning and getting to know each other at that level before you commit, you know, two, three, four, five, the rest of your life, years, the rest of your life to someone without actually knowing them, like really get to know them and what they want to be in the world. Yeah. And if that person is struggling consistently to have those conversations with you and you're a growth orientated person it's telling you something about the relationship exactly exactly um there was uh, gosh it was at least a year and a half ago i had a guest um i don't know if you know him his name is andy drish and, no i don't no and he's uh he was talking about his relationship that was modeled to him by a couple uh, I can't remember who this couple was, but they used to make this beautiful, um, those, there's like these ceramic figurines from Hallmark and I forget the name of the Ooh. couple, but anyway, um, he got to spend some time with them and he learned so much from them about how they've been so happily married all these years and how they spend, um, time together, <laughs> even though they have, I don't know how many children, but, one of the things that he said to me that really, it just sounded such a beautiful way that I don't feel like a lot of couples do this, but he said that um, quarterly, they will plan a, um, like a long weekend together to sort of come together and be alone and sort of build a relationship away from everything, work and family and everything. 
And then once a week, they, is it once a week or once a month, they'll come, no, it's, it's both, I think. Um, they will come together, uh, not just for a, for a date night, but to actually ha- like have a real discussion about like, how is there, like, how are you feeling about us this week? Was there anything that is making you, f- you, know, you know, that you got mad at me about or that's making you mm. uncomfortable? And I love, I love that because, if there's any sort of small resentments or little things that a lot of people tend to keep in and they don't talk about it, um, I think it's a really nice way to get things out in the open before things, it just leads to bigger arguments or bigger, bigger things. Yes. Yes. Completely agree. And that's something that both Christine and I practice on a regular basis. And for me, I, I, and both, both Christine and I, we'll sit with it for a period of time. So if there's a, a tension point or something that we're experiencing that we're uncomfortable with or that we need to discuss, uh, I make a very clear effort to not blurt it out. I'll sit with it. I'll go to my own private council if I need to. That's a, a group of, of people that I have that's supporting me uh, if I really need to. Before you know, before I just blurt it out to, to Christine, is there something that we forget in partnership is that – and whether you're in a monogamous or non-monogamous relationship, it's actually irrelevant – uh, in this case, is that we've evolved in tribe. And so in our tribes, we had councilmen, we had priests, we had doctors, we had you know therapists per se, we had guidance, we had mentors, we had brothers, we had sisters, we had mother figures, we had father figures, we had all of that in tribe. And now as a, com- as a global community, we're more isolated than that. And so we have we place massive unconscious expectations on our partners to fulfill all these different roles. And that's very heavy on a partner. You're, you know, you're, essentially your partner's not your fucking therapist and right. they can't be. Right. It doesn't mean you can't discuss issues with them and pain points with them, but you can't, you can't vomit everything onto them and then expect them to open, them, open themselves up to you sexually as well when they're dealing with all your unchecked trauma or emotional, right. emotional baggage and vomit. You know? Good like, point. <laughs> you know, that's really important. So, so you know, Christine and I, we make sure that we, and, and she probably, she's actually, honestly, if I'd be really clear and honest on this, she's better at this than me. Um, I'll sit with it more with myself and, <laughs> and generally not, not deal with it appropriately. And, and then I'll maybe do a little bit of vomit on her, but not in that, not in that way. Um, and then I'll go to council or then I'll go back into myself and I just, I try and be more autonomous and sovereign and sometimes it works really well and sometimes not so well so i'm still you know i'm still growing and balancing through okay i really need to reach out to someone now as opposed to delaying that and then we'll check in with each other and when we do that we're way less charged and so when we cut we're able to we're easier able to come from a place of compassion and love and and non-judgment and that's very helpful and we do that regularly um and that's a that's a powerful practice for us as well Mm, I love that. Yeah. Perfect. Mm. Well, let's see. Um, that was pretty much like all the major questions that I had. Was there anything that you wanted to add? Uh, I mean, oh, there's so much I could add. Uh, I mean, depending, I, depending on which, <laughs> where we want to go, or what, we're, what we're going to speak to. But yeah, I mean, it, it's, you know, relationships require effort. Yes. And that's something I really learned. And, and it's that isn't a novelty. That is that is that is real real stuff. Uh, relationships require immense effort. Not all the time. It doesn't have to be this arduous thing in your life right. that is sapping your energy. But when it when it's when it's go time, it's go time. Like it's it's going to require effort. It's going to require you to dig deep to push past some of your own wounding and your pains and your and your yuckiness and the uglier you know quote unquote the ugly parts of self and to really go in there with your partner and get into the trenches and and know that you can recover from that and that you can flourish even deeper in intimacy and love and connection and in the relationship and in how you serve each other in the world. And it requires effort and willingness. Like that that is something that's very, very important and under undervalued in relationships. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think there's also I mean, I just see a lot of couples, you know, just even simply not knowing how to communicate or communicating their their deepest fears or um, their feelings. And so everything's sort mm. of bottled up and then nothing gets resolved. Mm. I see that 
often. Mm-hmm. Yeah, as do I. Yeah. As do I. So how yeah. can And the people... resentment builds. Yes, it does build. It does build. So how can people find you? And and tell us how you do you you coach men? Tell me how you work. Yeah, of course. Thank you for asking. Yes, I I, uh, I coach men and I I coach uh, women as well on a one on one on a one on one level on a one on one basis. Um, and I also work with men in groups, and uh, we'll be beginning to work with women in groups as well, and really bringing our uh, feminine masculine balance and and helping women really understand the masculine at a deeper level and in turn, of course, knowing themselves and knowing their own inner feminine at a deeper level through really connecting to healthy masculine principles and learning how to bring in men in their life, in their lives that align with that. But also if they're in relationship, bringing out the best in their man in a way that is not emasculating or in a way that really supports men in their lives as well. So you know, I work with um, both men and women in different ways. Um, you can reach me on, on any of my social media channels, Stephanos Sefandos. Mm-hmm. Uh, my website is stephanossefandos.com. Um, so, yeah, that's very, very easy to, to reach me. Just, uh, just the name is a little bit long. But <laughs> put that in your show notes. I'm sure people will be able to find that. And then Instagram? Yes, yeah. Stephanos Sefandos. Same yeah. thing. Okay, great. Yeah. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for this. I have been, I was really looking forward to talking to you about this and just kind of putting together some, some questions that to just bring out some questions that maybe some couples can start asking and proposing in their current relationships and hoping to maybe have them become closer and have deeper connections. Yes. Amazing. Stephanos, thank you so much for your time and we will talk soon. Thank you. All right. If you love this conversation and you want to learn more about Stephanos and his offerings, head on over to margaretromero.com forward slash episode 117. And I will speak to you all next week. Thank you so much for listening. Wherever you are in this world, I appreciate and love you. Goodbye for now.